All right. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and get started while you are doing that. We were in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 is where we had started. Then we went to verse 18. <clears throat> now in verse 18 it says, Now all things are of God. Those are those things that the old things have passed away and all things have become new. All those new things are of God in you. And he says, Who hath, notice past tense, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath, past tense, given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, again, you're going to see a, a, an overlap. If you've been to the DHT, you're going to see an overlap in a lot of this stuff. We don't have a healing ministry. We don't have a deliverance ministry. We don't have an evangelism ministry. We have the ministry of reconciliation. That's the only ministry that is mentioned, right, in the Bible, basically. And that ministry of reconciliation is very simple. You say, then where does healing come in? Where does salvation come in? Okay, when you minister to a person and you reconcile their spirit to God, that's the ministry of reconciliation, and they get born again, that's evangelism, that is salvation. If you reconcile their soul to God, that is the ministry of reconciliation, but it is reconciling the soul is what we, what we generally call deliverance. When we reconcile the body, we are reconciling the body to God, and that's called healing. So no matter what you're doing ministry-wise, it's going to be reconciling some part of man back to God. Now, Jesus has already done this. He has already reconciled us back to God. Now, our job is not to go and say, God can do this. It's to say, God has done this. It's to say, if you're sick, it's to say, you're healed. Right? Why? Because Jesus, again, past tense. And if you've listened to many of our materials, I've always had a tendency to talk very fast. And sometimes it's hard for people to understand me because I do. Now, one of the reasons I tend to talk fast is because I pray in tongues a lot. And the more you pray in tongues, the faster you can talk in your natural language. And many times whenever I'm doing a seminar or I'm anywhere teaching, I have a limited amount of time and an unlimited amount of material, okay? And so a lot of times I'm trying to get as much in as possible. People, they've actually done uh, some studies or what you want to call it on our, on our uh, CDs and things. And on the average, I get at least twice as many words on a CD as an average minister. So you're actually getting twice as much material on one CD. So, and, and we don't charge you double. You know, it's, 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 keep it simple. So we're trying. To, amen. <laughs> but in these seminars, I'm actually slowing down, and I'm doing that on purpose because I want to take these things and just take them piece by piece. <clears throat> when I was in the martial arts, we always had guys that come in there were always wanting to learn the next technique. No matter where they were, they always wanted to know the next technique. Next thing, next thing. Teach us something new, teach us something new, 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 all the time. And invariably, those guys hardly ever could do any of them right. You know, they knew a thousand techniques partially. But the people that always beat them in sparring and beat them in training were the people that knew one or two techniques very well. And so it's not about how much you learn. It's the fact that you learn accurately a few things that will work. And then from that, you always have time to grow from that. You can always add to your repertoire, so to speak. But the key is get the basics. Learn the basics. If you don't know the basics, no matter what the other stuff anybody teaches you, no matter what that is, it will fall apart on you in the middle of the fight. Right? You will never be able to really do what, what you need to do. So you may look very good at getting beat up, but that's not, your, that's not what you want. Right? You, you don't want to look good getting beat up. Right? And, and it doesn't matter if you don't look good winning. Right? Winning is winning, whether you look good doing it or not. Amen? So learn a few things. Whether it's pretty or not, doesn't matter. Just make sure they work. Well, the Bible works. Right? So let's focus on some of these things. So I'm slowing down on purpose to draw attention. Many times when I speak very quickly, I'll say things, and because you're moving along with me, I'll say something that's very important, but it just gets passed over. 
because we go through it so quick. So I'm purposely slowing down so that I'm causing you to take time to look at it. All right. So again, let's get back in here. Notice here, <clears throat> it says that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's the ministry you have. Now, <clears throat> underneath that it says, this verse tells us that the new things that were put in us at the new birth were not of ourselves, but were actually created by God himself and put within us, making us brand new, and that everything in us, now in us, in our spirit, is of God. And it is by God and it is from God. Nothing in you now is of you or from you. Right? You get that? Nothing. In other words, even in you now, there's still no part in you that is of you that is good. Right? That's why you had to die to come into Christ. Even if you study, if you go back into Ezekiel, and Ezekiel 18 where it talks about uh, the generational curse, what we generally call generational curses, it says in there that he's going through this whole thing in the process. If you do this, if you do that, and if you do that, and if you don't watch your, you know, if you see your dad's sin, you don't commit him, then you will not be held accountable by, for your dad's sin. It says all that in Ezekiel 18. Totally destroys all of the generational curse teaching. Totally and completely. Right? Just read Ezekiel 18. It answers everything. Just that one chapter. Don't need a commentary. Just read it. Exactly what it says. Now, when in that, in Ezekiel 18, it says that God, and it even says it through Numbers and in Exodus, it says that God has mercy into thousands. And he shows mercy. And it, show, and it talks about God's goodness to people. And then it says, who will by no means clear the guilty. It says that God will not clear the guilty. And yet the entire church is always trying to get God to clear the guilty. You, you'll never be cleared from guilt. Now, understand, I'm, let, me, let me finish before you just jump on that, okay? It's not that you're going to have your guilt removed. It's that you're going to die. See, if you don't die, you're still guilty. The only way you're not guilty is in Christ. If you're not going to be in Christ, you're always going to be guilty, right? He's not going to make you right. He's going to make you dead and hide you in Christ, and now it's Christ that lives and no longer you. Do you understand? But until you die, until your life is hid in Christ, and as long as you are still standing outside of Christ, and, and you're still out there, and you're trying to live right, and do right, and be right, and get all the anointings, and get all the giftings, and fast enough, and pray enough, you're still trying to exert and enforce your own righteousness. You're trying to say, I, I, God, take this filthy person and by my good works I will clean myself up to a point where I am worthy to be saved and used. And that is the worst thing you can do in the kingdom of God. That is the worst. The, the key is to bow your knee and when you bow your knee to Jesus as your Lord, you die. And you are hid in him. And it's no longer you. See, that's what makes it so easy. I can tell you you're healed by the stripes of Jesus because it ain't me having to do it. Right? It's him. He did it. And it's not something you're going to do to get it. It's what he's already done. Now, if you can believe it, you can get healed. If I can believe it, I can get you healed. You see, that's all there is to it. It's not a matter of what we've got to do. The Bible says, let us labor, in Hebrews, to enter into his rest. Now, that sounds like a contradiction. Labor to enter into his rest. But we're not laboring to receive the blessing of God. We're laboring to enter into his rest, which is simply to go in. And it, believe it or not, that's the hardest thing. It's easy to do works. It's easy to go out there and try to work your way to heaven. That's easy in the sense that, well, if I do this, I can do that. I can, I can decide to go fast. I can decide to go pray. I can decide to do these things. And it's easy to do these things because I think I'm earning it. And earning something requires no humility, no submission, nothing. I get this because I earned it. And, and when you do that, you're not bowing your knee to Jesus. You are maintaining who you are. And I did this in America, as like many other places, it always goes back to, I'm a self-made man. Nobody put me here. Nobody helped me get here. I did this on my own. And that is in the church. It's the same thing. I fasted. I prayed. I did this and that. I got a, even if it's I got a hold of this person and they 
pass their anointing to me. It's always something I did to do it. But laboring to enter the rest, it's a labor to enter that rest. Because it's hard for us to say, I can't do anything to deserve this. Right? There is truth to that. So that's the hard part. It is laboring. Now the labor part is not just getting there, but staying there. Because once you get in there, you keep wanting to try to come back out and do this and do that. And we were talking about this the other day, actually, I think it was. The easiest way to find out what somebody believes is, for instance, when they're praying for the sick, is for them not to get results. As soon as they don't get results, you find out what they really believe. Because that's when they revert back to other teaching, this thing, that thing. In other words, what we teach and what the Bible teaches about healing is that we as Christians have the authority and the right to command sickness and disease, devils, any of those problems to go. Bottom line, whether the devil is in you, around you, on you, whether you invited it in, no matter what, I don't care where you are with God, I have authority over that devil. I can tell that devil to leave you. Whether, even if you want to keep that devil, I can make it leave you. Right? Why? Because wherever you are has nothing to do with my authority in Jesus Christ. And it does not, your faith or disbelief or unbelief or anything else has, does not affect the promise that God gave me that if I lay hands on a the sick, they shall recover. Or if I cast out a devil, that it has to go. Where you stand does not affect my standing with God. You get that? Now that's just as kind of blunt as I can get it. So based on that, we do everything through authority, through dominion, through exercising the authority of Jesus Christ. Not based on what we've done, but based on what he's done. We exercise the authority that at that name, everything that has a name must bow its knee. Well, I'm using that name. So sickness has to bow its knee because I'm using that name. Not because I fasted and prayed, but because I'm using that name. You understand? Even Peter said, and, and if you've been to the DHT, again, Acts 3 is a key. Because in Acts 3, it says that Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. They had not prayed. Right? They weren't prayed up. They had not been fasting. They were going to the temple to pray. And on the way to the temple, they saw a lame man. And Peter told him, silver and gold, I don't have. But what I got, I give you in the name. Get up. Isn't that right? And then he healed him. And then everybody's come around. And he said, why are you looking at on us? as though by our own power or holiness. In other words, why are you looking at us as though I have a special anointing or I lived holy enough, I fasted and prayed enough until God would use me? That's ex he said that is not what happened. He said, but it was by the name of Jesus and faith in that name that made this man whole. Amen. Now you hear that? They were on their way to pray. They had not prayed, so they had not prayed up. So it had nothing to do with that. It was by the name of Jesus and faith in that name. That's all. Now, if you are a Christian, now the Bible is very clear that there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Right? So if you are in Jesus, you got there because of the name. You got into Jesus because of that name. You believed on that name. And now that name is your name. It is just like when a husband and wife marry, the wife takes the husband's name. You have taken on the name of Jesus. Now when you use that name, you have the right to use that name at any time on anything that is in the will of God. Amen? You don't need permission. And you're not guessing. You're not saying, I'm using the name. See, the church looks at it like we'd write a check. And when you write a check, there's a place for the signature. And the wife, now she might write her first name, but now the wife writes the husband's last name. Because it's her name, right? The wife's check does not need a cosigner. Right? She didn't write the check and sign it, and then the husband said, here, would you, would you co-sign this? And then he has to sign it. It isn't that way. Why? Because she has full authority to use that name. Right? There's no need for a co-signer. But the church uses the name of Jesus like, a co like it needs a co-signer. In the name of Jesus, go. Is that all right? <laughs> you backing me up on this? No. You're doing it. You're, you're using the name, and when you use the name, the backing is in the name. You understand? It's not, let's use the name and see what happens. Using the name makes it happen. Right? You say, well, how come it hasn't worked for me? Because you don't believe in the name. Simple as that. You just don't believe in the power that's in the name. You don't believe, now listen, this is very, very simple. If, if you use the name and it doesn't work, it is because you don't believe that at that name, everything that has a name has to bow its knee. 
you believe there are still things that can cause things not to have to bow their knee. Right? If you, and, and believe me, we're taught many times in the church that there are a dozen things that can make it where it doesn't have to obey. You know, well, there's sin in that person's life. Well, James didn't say that. James said the elders will pray the prayer of faith and the Lord will raise him up. And if the man's committed sin, it'll be forgiven. Didn't say anything about the man. Didn't say get the sin out first. That's after the man's healed, he's forgiven. Right? Your healing was paid for before your sins were forgiven. Amen? So we need to get these things in line. Now, again, this is not a healing seminar, but healing is a good way of demonstrating and of talking about these things and, and bringing it out. Now, so you have to stop separating yourself. When you use the name of Jesus, when a policeman gets out in a blue uniform with a badge, with a gun, stands out there and puts his hand up, you stop. Right? You don't say, well, how do I know he's a real cop? How do I know that the chief really likes this guy? Maybe the chief doesn't like this guy. Maybe I shouldn't have to listen to him because the chief doesn't like him. So you don't think that way. You say, uniform, badge, gun, right? He's got the authority, that's it, right? You don't look at all the why it might not work. You just <laughs> obey. And you don't care what policeman is in that uniform. Amen? You don't care what the name is on the... He's not standing out there going, in the name of officer so-and-so, you stop. No, he says in the name of the law or in the name of the city of you know, wherever... Because that's, he's not operating in his authority. He's operating in the authority of the city that hired him. Right? Well, you're not operating. See, this is where the church is. We've messed this up. We think I have to fast enough, pray enough, do enough, get enough anointings, all that stuff. Well, if that's true, when, if you can fast enough for God to use you when you go out, you ought to be able to say, in the name of Curry Blake or in your name. Why? Because you've done what it takes to get that power. But you're not going in, in your name. You're going in his name. You're going based on what he's done, not what you've done. It's his authority, not your authority. Amen? You're not in your authority. It's his authority. But now you no longer live, but now it's Christ who lives in you. So if you no longer live, it has nothing to do with you. So whenever you say go, it's God speaking through you. Yes. Amen? Yes. Isn't it simple? Yeah. I, I do not see how... Well, first off, people can't argue with it. People either believe it or don't, but they can't argue with it. That's the beauty of it. I don't have to debate this. <laughs> you know, it's been amazing. Amazingly simple. He's like, there it is, okay. You want, to, you want to talk about it? Show me scripture. Well, in our church, I don't care about your church. Yeah. You know, your church was wrong before you got there too. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it, it doesn't have anything to do with your church or your statement of faith. or anything. It has to do with this word, right? The devil doesn't listen to you in the name of such and such church. He listens to you in the name of Jesus. That's what counts. It's his authority. It's his name. Right? Die to yourself. Get over yourself. Get out of your mind. Right? Get out of you. Don't think about you. Don't think about what you've done. Don't, don't even put yourself in the equation. Step up. When I, as I've said before, when I stand in front of people, I do not represent man to God. I represent God to man. So when I stand in front of people, I don't talk like man. I'm not representing man. I talk like God. Why? Because I'm representing God. You don't really talk like a man. Man talks like, well, here's why you might not get it. You know, if you're this, this, or this, no, God don't love you enough to, or he, he won't do it for you until you get all that out. And You know, remember the old days, and the old Pentecostal days? Well, if you, uh, why, why don't you receive the Holy Ghost? I'm trying, I want to receive the, well, if you'd take that jewelry off, you, he'd fill you with the Holy Ghost. I mean, come on, if you take that ring off, he'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. Come on, you really think he's worried about a ring? You're telling me that little ring can stop the power of God? Well, we ought to put that up on an altar and all bow down to it. Right? That ain't going to... I mean, come on, it says that Jesus has a girdle of gold on. If he's got a girdle of gold, I doubt if he's worried about that little band of gold you wear. Right? Now, you know, unless you worship that thing, then he, then he doesn't like that. But we have, to get our, we have to get over ourselves. Get yourself out of the equation. Don't even think about it if you have enough faith. Because right? it's not about... See, what we've done, we've turned this into humanism. Do I have enough faith to do this? In other words, it's back on me. No, it's my faith is in him. He is big enough to do this. It's not about how much faith I have. It's not about how, much, how big my faith is. It's about how big the God is in whom I have faith. Do you understand that? It's what, what can he do? Now, you say, well, he can do anything. Okay, that doesn't help. That's too broad. You've got to narrow it down. You've got to be able to say, can he do this? Yes. All right. Believe that. When you believe that, now he's become big enough to actually do that. Now, if you believe he can do that, then guess what? 
If you believe, let me ask this, how many of you believe that God can raise the dead? You believe that? Okay. How many of you believe that, now, now listen carefully, I'm, I'm, I'm differentiating you from God. Okay. How many of you believe that you can raise the dead? I'm not talking about the power of God. Hang on. I, I don't want to, you okay. In other words, you as a human. Okay. Take the Spirit of God away from you. He's over there. You're over here. Now, can you raise the dead? No. Why? Because it's Him that does it, right? Now, so you have faith that God can raise the dead, right? All right. Now, the problem is now we stop. You believe that. But now, whenever the dead, someone dies, generally people's first thought is, do I have enough faith to do this? No, no. It's not that. It's do you believe God can do it? It's not faith in your faith. It's faith in Him. You understand? Your faith, can God do it? Yeah, He's big enough to do it. Then that's how much faith you have. You have faith to raise the dead because you have faith in the God who raises the dead. It's not about your faith. It's not, well, I have this much faith or this much or this much. No, it's not that at all. It is the God in whom you have faith. You understand? But if you just say God can do all things, then He'll never do anything because you're not narrowing it down. Well, it'd be like... The child said, well, my, my daddy will take me anywhere I want to go. Well, where are you going? Well, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> but you just said your dad will take you anywhere you want to go. Yeah, but, you know. Well, where do you want to go? Well, I don't know. I just want to go anywhere. Wait, you can't get in a car and go anywhere. you got to go somewhere. Right? So you got to specify. I, I didn't just get in the car in Dallas and go, well, we're just going to a meeting. Well, where are you going? I don't know. <laughs> we're just going to drive, you know. We'll see. We'll see if we pull up in front of a church and there's people there, I guess. I don't know. No, you don't do that. You know where you're going, right? You have to set things, right? <clears throat> this, is, this is how faith comes to being. Yeah. Is that you have, to, you have to set the point to say, that's where God is going to meet us. Yeah. Right? When I get there, God's going to be there. And, and when I do that, here's what he's going to be doing. Why? Because he's big enough to do that there. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Isn't this simple? This is just what faith is. Now, <clears throat> let's look back at this and i got to, again... I'm going to bring a stopwatch. I mean, a, a alarm. Bring my alarm clock up here. <laughs> now, <clears throat> notice this. It says in verse 19, "To wit, or to know, that God was in Christ." Now, was God in Christ? Yes. God was in Christ, right? Okay. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Just making sure. <clears throat> God was in Christ. Now, what was He doing in Christ? Reconciling the world unto Himself. So God was in Christ bringing the world back to God, right? Not bringing the world to Christ, but bringing the world to God. Now, technically, we know they're one, but just, I'm, I'm just specifying to make you think. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath. Now, what is, what is hath? Past tense, all right? Hath committed, and the word, the letters ed on the end of the word always means past tense. So you'll always see hath and then past tense word next hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. <clears throat> now, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to say something, if I get a chance to hear, that is rather, I don't want to say dramatic, but um, rather bold, okay? Um, <clears throat> some of you will probably end up thinking, you know, how can you say that? Because when you say that, you're eliminating this. And I'm going to say that anyway. All right, <laughs> because I want to eliminate this. All right, you say, what are you talking about? Well, now you're listening and pay attention, and you'll know when I get there. Okay, <laughs> so, but now notice, he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This verse says that we are to know, or to, to wit, that God was in Christ, working through him and in conjunction with Jesus, to accomplish the goal of reconciliation between God and man, and that it was God that has, past tense, already done it, committed, a sign put under our stewardship, the word of reconciliation between God and man. So our job <clears throat> is to tell people that God, that there's nothing between them anymore. But they still have to turn to Him. Amen? I mean, there can be a cure for any disease, but if you don't take the cure, you're still going to die. So Jesus is the cure. <clears throat> but there's no problem, but you have to take the cure to have the no problem. Amen? You get that? All right. In verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. Now notice, God was in Christ drawing men to God. Now Christ has turned that job over to us. Now we're ambassadors for Christ, beseeching you as if God was, was using us to beseech you to himself. 
In other words, we have taken Jesus' place on this earth. What God was doing through Jesus, he is now doing through us. He accomplished his work through Jesus, but now we have to fulfill that and bring it to fruition to tell people it's done. Amen? Yes. <clears throat> now, in verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now notice, that we might be made. As you study this, you're, the thing I want you to do is look at every word. Every word. Read slow, read every word. Okay? God has made you. You have not attained it. He made you that when you got born again. Instantly, He made you righteous. You're not going to grow in righteousness. Right? You are the righteousness of God. You've got His right. You are right with Him. You're not going to grow in right. You'll grow in knowledge. You'll grow in wisdom. You'll grow in understanding. You can grow in revelation. But you will never... You understand all those things have to do with your understanding some, to some degree. But your position will never change. Right? In other words, you're never going to be more righteous or less righteous. You are righteous with God's righteousness. And you were made that way. Now, you're, now that's in the spirit. Now in your mind, that varies. Right? And usually if you go out and sin real big somehow, then usually your understanding of that backs off of that. Right? And then that draws you hopefully back to repentance to God to say, yeah, you're right. That was stupid. I shouldn't have done that. Right? And then you walk with him. And if you do that and you confess that, which means to say the same thing or agree with, then he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And that means that that's gone out. But that agreement is what allows him to do that. And then you step back into right fellowship with him. Amen? Do you get that? Now, he says it. And as we used to say in old Pentecostal days, in old Pentecostal days, your, your righteousness was established by God. But if you're out here, you don't want to die that way. Right? You want, to, you want to be where you should be when you die. Not where you used to be. And I always tell people, if you, are, if, if you were ever more on fire for God than you are now, then you're backslid. Right? And it, no matter how much you know, no matter how much you're excited, none of that. Your, your, your obedience to God must match your knowledge of the Word of God and the will of God. If your obedience to the will of God does not match what you know of the Word of God, you're backslid, right? Regardless of how excited you are and all that kind of stuff, your, your obedience has to match the knowledge, right? So you always want to walk in what you know. Now, he says here, in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 1, We then, as workers together with him, I just want to emphasize that with him, now watch, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. In Galatians chapter 6. Now this is kind of moving more into what we're going to be talking about during these services. Verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, now notice, I'm reading slow, emphasizes, in Christ Jesus, Neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision. Well, what was circumcision? A sign of the covenant. In other words, fulfilling the ritualistic law, doing these things, fulfilling the law, none of that counts in Christ. For in Christ, none of that matters. Circumcision doesn't avail anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. What counts in Christ? Being a new creature. Right? It's not that you, well, I've done this right, done that right. Because once you start delineating what you've done right, now that gives the devil the right to delineate what you've done wrong. Right? See, if you say, I'm living by these rules, that once you mess up, the devil can say, but you blew it there, so none of the others count. Because I don't care how good you do in life. The minute you violate a law, you're a criminal. Right? They don't care. If a, if a policeman stops you and says, you ran that stop sign, you say, yeah, but I stopped at 10 before that. <laughs> He's going to say, I don't care, you, you ran the one, right? That's what I'm getting you for. So it doesn't matter how many of those you stop at, it's the one you run that makes you a criminal, right? 
It's the same thing. That's why it's ridiculous to try to go back under the law and try to fulfill the law because you can do all that perfectly and as soon as you mess up, you're still a criminal. Amen? So don't. Look, the easiest way to beat the game is don't play the game. Amen. Right? Easiest way not to violate the law is don't go under the law. Once you're not under the law, then they can't hold you accountable to the law. Right? That, that's the best way not to get beat. Okay? Now, he says, but a new creature, that's the point I want to get to. In Ephesians 2.15, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, or the warfare between the animosity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. You hear that? He said, look, we pushed that law aside, now, it's not that you're going to obey this so you can say, I did this, I did that, I did this. You're not going to do that. He said, we pushed that aside. Now, what counts here is that God, through Christ, has joined us together to make two into one, right? For that union. And thereby making peace. Why? See, when you come into Christ, now think about this. When you come into Christ, if you're in Christ, for God to condemn you, he's got to condemn Christ. Right? Now, if you keep, and this is our problem in the church, we want to talk about my anointing, my gifting, my calling, my ministry, and we keep sticking our heads out. You know? You, what it is, your life is hid in Christ. Stay hid in Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. So the life that I now live, I live through the faith of the Son of God. I go about doing, but it's the works of Christ that are being done because it's the Spirit of my Father in me. He does the works. So everything I'm doing, he's doing it. I just put the hands to it, and he gets to work through it. But even then, it's not me doing it, it's Christ doing it. You understand? Because the minute I start saying, this is me, I get it through fasting, get it through prayer, get it through my gifting, get it through my... All of a sudden now, you're no longer hidden in Christ. Why? Because it's me, and you pull your head outside of Christ, and the devil, now he can find you. See, before then, you're hidden. He can't find you. You say, go in the name of Jesus, he goes, oh, that's, that sounds like Jesus talking to me. Why? Because it's coming out of Jesus. But the minute you stick your head out and you go, my ministry, my calling, I'm this, I'm that. All of a sudden, go, oh, there you are. I've been looking for you. Right? And that's when you get slapped around. So the key is to stay hid. Right? And the way you do that is you literally have to reckon yourself dead. You have to count the old man as dead, not to live after him, which lacks preeminence. It lacks to be the person. But instead, you die and you refuse to act on that. I'm not saying it doesn't come up at times, but you don't act on it. And if you continue not to act on it, it dies. Right? You don't feed it. So you purposely go out of your way. Now, notice here, go to the next one. Now, a lot of this is just going to be just pure scripture. Okay? Which is good. Paul said, he wrote to the Colossians, and he said, these things, actually in Ephesians, at one point he said, the revelations that God has given me, you will understand when you read what I've written. Now think about that. He didn't say you'll understand it when God quickens it to you. He didn't say you'll understand it whenever you get a gift of revelation or get this. He said you will understand it when you read. Isn't that something? People say, well, I don't understand this. What you're telling me is you haven't been reading it. When you read it, you'll understand it. You know, if you're born of him. Now if you read it and don't understand it, it might be because you're not born again. Because to the natural person, all of this is foolishness. But a spiritual person, a person in whom is the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit is there to teach you and to lead and guide you into all truth. And since this is truth, He's there to teach you this. So you don't technically need me. Now, if I do my job right, I'm not even teaching you. If I do my job correctly, I have submitted under Him to where it is Him teaching you through me. Right? So I can't even take credit for the teaching. I can't even take credit for what you do. I can't take credit for any of that. All I can say is, here it is. And then you go do something with it. Amen? Now, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Hear that? He, didn't, he said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So you possess a mind, but your mind is not you. Right? Your, the spirit you. But it be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man. Now, he's going to give us a description of this new man. 
the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness after God. In other words, the new man that's in you, when God created this new spirit in you, this new spirit was created in the likeness and image of righteousness and true holiness to resemble God. That's what that verse says. That is who is in you. That's why for you to live in sin, and, and I'm, even, I'm not going to say these are all equal, but let's say for you to live in sin, that's why it's so wrong. Not because it's just wrong for you to do wrong things, but because you're so far above that. That that has nothing to do with you, and yet you're deciding to come down and live in this lower level life. It is so far below what God created us for. And he said, and the bad part is it's not just sin, but to live in, honestly, in, in, in anything. Even David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. For you to live in poverty is not God's will. Right? For you to live in sickness, it's not God's will. Right? For you, you're supposed to live like Jesus lived. What does that mean? Jesus always had everything he needed. He had food. He had everything. Now, and people say, well, he didn't have a place to live. Didn't need one. Right? But he stayed in people's houses. They let him stay places. So he always had a roof over his head. Right? I mean, unless I guess he didn't want one and spent night in the garden, you know. But the key is, whatever he needed, when he needed tax money, he didn't say, all right, let's, you know, let, let's sow a seed somewhere so we can get our tax money given to us. He said, no, go for, he told a fisherman, go fishing. If his men had been farmers, he would have said, all right, boys, we need some tax money, so grab your plow, we're going to go out there and plow up a field, and you're going to come across a bag of money. Why? But since they were fishermen, he sent one to fish. Right? So whatever was needed was always provided. He never worried about not having it because God didn't expect him to live worrying about it. He even said, he said, listen, don't think about what you're going to eat. Don't think about what clothes you're going to wear and where you're going to... He said, that's the way the pagans live. Why? Because they don't have a God. They have to worry about what they're going to get next, what they're going to have next. They've got to worry about what they're going to eat next because they don't have a God to take care of them. He said, don't be like them. You have a heavenly father that takes care of the, the birds, takes care of the flowers. You have a heavenly father. He's going to take care of you. If, if you're heavenly, he said, if you, if you have a son, if you have a child that asks for this, is he going to give him that? No. He said, your heavenly father is the same way. He knows what, what you have need of. He said, but seek first his kingdom. Yes. Seek first his righteousness. In other words, keep your mind focused on things that are above. It's not a matter of seeking God, oh God, please come. It's not that kind of seeking. It is a constant, even we would call it a constant study, a constant going into, a constant looking after. It's what he talks about when he says, think on these things. Think on things. He says, set your affections on things above, things that are in heaven. That's where you set your affection. Not on, well, see, if you're thinking about things that are above, you're not thinking about eating, you know, the food. Or we, and it isn't, that's not to say don't, make, don't plan for supper, all right? What are we going to eat tonight? I don't know. Jesus said, don't worry about it. No, that's not what he's talking about. Okay? <laughs> that's when you need a word. We, you know, we, we, want, we want mashed potatoes and, you know, getting about lunchtime, ain't it? <laughs> he, say, he said, don't worry about these things. He's not talking about don't think about them. But he says, but if you're busy thinking about things that are above, you won't take the time to worry about these other things. And, and your worry shows that you don't think you have a God that will take care of you. I mean, think how much more effective you could be if you didn't have to always be thinking about paying this bill, paying that bill. I'm not saying don't pay it. I'm saying always worry about if it's going to be there when the bill comes due. Imagine how much more effective you'd be for the kingdom of God if you could say, you know what? We're, we're going to make sure we go witness. We're going to make sure we lead. And I'm not talking about saying, well, we're going to go witness so God will pay me a salary so that I can pay my bills. That's not it either. You're a child of the kingdom. You live in the kingdom. He will provide for you. But your lifestyle should represent the kingdom. It should be kingdom stuff. Amen? It should be healing the sick. It should be casting out devils. It should be raising the dead. It should be clothing the naked. It, amen? It should be feeding the hungry. Well, you can't feed the hungry if you're the hungry. Right? You, that's what God had to deal with me on that. And he, he had to show me. Because I, I told him, because I was brought up you know, kind of strong Pentecostal background, you know, which basically said if, you're got, if you have any money at all left over, somehow you're in sin because you had to go after money to get it, you know? And that was the idea. I mean, honestly, I was raised up, and, and it's funny because we didn't live that way, but that's what I heard in church. And it was amazing because one day I asked God about this. I said, God, we could, we could do so much more with this, and, you know, people are calling us here and calling us there. And he said, 
Okay, what do I want you to do? And I, I had to go, do I want you to uh, support missionaries? Yeah. yeah. Do I want you to pay your bills on time so you're a good witness to the people around you? Well, yeah. Do I want you to you know, tithe an offering? Well, yeah. Do I want you to, to support Bible schools? Yeah. Well, if you're going to do all that, guess what? It's going to take money, right? I mean, if I go to Australia or if I go to South Africa, the airline doesn't care that I'm going over on a mission trip, right? What they want to see is, is the money on your card, right? Because they sell tickets. They're not out there. They're, they're not a mission organization, right? And so I, I said, okay, God, I understand. He said, so then that means that you have to have money to do all these things. Now, if you're only worried about you eating in your house and you paying your bills, then there's missionaries that aren't being supported. What does that tell me? I'm more interested in me than I am in the world. See, that's, where, that's what the devil tries to keep you always tied up, is he always tries to keep your mind on you and worried about your bills and what you're going to have so that you're never really touching the world. And the minute I got out of that, the minute I broke that off and said, you know what, God wants me to go, he wants me to touch lives, he wants me to support missionaries, he wants me to, to build Bible schools, all of a sudden, all that broke loose, and I don't even think about bills at home anymore. I'm more thinking about building Bible schools and planting churches and mission trips. And it's amazing. Our bills are always paid. Okay? And you say, well, that's because you travel around the world and you're a preacher. And I'm telling you, there are a lot of preachers out there that are worried about the money. Amen? And, and my guys will tell you, we don't talk like that. We, don't, we, we, we decide what God wants us to do. And then we head that direction. And if we ran out of money on the way, then it's up to God to bring it. But we're heading that way. We're not going to sit and wait till it's piled up and then go. We go and God takes care of it along the way. Amen? And we don't make decisions based on money. And, you know, in that sense. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go get a 10,000 seat auditorium if I got 20 people. All right? Now, I will get a 500 seat auditorium if I got 20 people and expect God to fill it. And then we'll go from there. We'll build on. Amen? And he'll pay for it. Amen? Even the, the car out there, that was one of the main things. We needed a new car. We needed a vehicle, a bigger one, because I can carry more guys with me and more stuff. And I need a bigger vehicle. I need a good vehicle. And pretty much I told God, I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> right? I want to put my money toward stuff that, you know, mission stuff and things. I, I don't want to have to take it out of my pocket to pay for it. I said, it's your, your ministry. We're doing this for you. You pay for it. Right? mentioned at one meeting in our partners and three people came up and said God told us to do this we we believe we want to do this and I said okay I already told everybody what vehicle I wanted I hadn't had it picked out but whenever and they didn't tell me how much they were gonna to put toward it and the funny thing was we started looking on the internet I found the vehicle I wanted we went up to Nebraska and they met me there and three different people three different envelopes none of them knew what each one of them gave when I got back added all the money up exactly to the penny the cost of that vehicle all right nothing left over but not lacking anything and guess what didn't come out of my pocket I didn't pay for it God paid for it amen now if God's gonna do that for a car the thing was all God was waiting for is for me to decide what kind of car I wanted right now I you know I guess I could have said oh, I want to escalate you know but I didn't I wanted Yukon or wanted a, a vehicle like that why because I really don't care it's comfortable it drives it's good God doesn't care what you have as long as you don't care. You know, when you start caring more about what it is, then that's when it starts to be an idol. That car is not an idol. It's a, it's, a, it's a tool. It gets me where I need to go so I can preach the gospel. Amen? And hopefully I'm rested when I get there. And, you know, I'm not getting beat up along the way because the car doesn't drive right. Amen? See, do you understand? And if people say, well, you know, why are you talking about finances? Because that tends to be, a, a, to a large degree, where people are. You know? I guarantee you, 99% of the people I talk to that want to do something for God, the only reason they don't, the reason they bring up, is because of finances. That's the only reason they bring up. Amen? And so I can talk this way because already, we've already taken an offering, so you, you know I'm not pulling on you to try to say, no, if you give, God, no, I don't do that. God, I don't, I, I don't live by sowing and reaping. I don't live that way anymore, right? Sowing and reaping is good, but it's an earthly, natural law. I live by kingdom law. And the kingdom law is, it's the Father's pleasure to give me the kingdom. It has nothing to do with sowing and reaping. But the beauty of it is, once I learn that, now I give more because I don't have to worry about what I'm holding back to. Well, I've got to keep this back to pay that. No, I can give all of it, and I know my Heavenly Father will replace whatever I put out plus more. But it's not a sowing and reaping. Do you understand? And the beauty of that is, 
that stops this manipulation thing where I would come in and try to say, and I've never done this, didn't ever believe in it, but it would stop it. And if you get a hold of this, you'll never be manipulated by some TV preacher or anybody else about this, about, well, now if you want to get blessed, you give and do this. You know, give this amount. You can't be manipulated anymore. Why? Because you live in the kingdom. It's all yours. That's what he said. It's the whole thing is yours. The whole kingdom is yours. He, Jesus said, they came back and they said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through, through your name. And he said, don't get excited about that, that a few devils listen to you, but rather that your names are written in heaven. Why? Because you could have authority over a few devils and not have anything else, but if your names are written in heaven, not only do devils have to listen to you, but you've got the whole kingdom. Everything is yours. Whatever you need is yours. The point is you have to decide that God is willing to give it to you. Amen? And then what you're going to do with it when you get it. Right? If you're going to heap it upon your own lust, well, that's you. Right? But if you're going to use it for the kingdom of God, there's no end to what he can do. I, I'm telling you, I, I, years ago, I'm not a kid from Texas anymore. I used to be. <clears throat> now I'm older. Okay? But I'm, I'm, I'm nobody. God took a kid's life. There was nobody. I had done everything I could try to do to pretty much mess my life up. I was somebody that nobody had any use for, nobody would listen to, I had no credibility, I had nothing. I'd done everything I could to mess it up. And God took that life, and now I go around the world. He takes me around the world. It doesn't cost me a dime in the end. And matter of fact, usually when I come back, I actually have some money in my pocket. It doesn't get any better than that. Amen? And we go around the world, and we see God heal and set free and deliver. And used to, that was a big deal. God, if I, if I never just get God to actually heal. That was a big deal in the start, just getting it to work. And you know what the neat thing is now? It's not that I go into South Africa and we have a line that lasts three hours and we got 13 people in wheelchairs and they all come out. That's, that's awesome, all right? It's great. But the, but the good thing is, now what really thrills me, and it's, I never really thought I would believe this way, but it's true. What thrills me now is when I hear testimonies from you and from people that have just lived. Many of you, we get testimonies all the time. People have never met me, never sat in a meeting, didn't sit under the anointing, you know, <laughs> none of that stuff. Just got a hold of a CD, listened to it, went and did it. And then they meet me and go, seen the dead raised, seen devils cast. I'm like, that's awesome. You know why? Because what that proves is it ain't me. It ain't about me. It's not about a gift. It's not about an anointing. It's about this word and that God is faithful to his word. Now it's good because now we know we have a faithful God. Well, that's better than having an anointing. Amen? The anointing might run dry. Something else might happen to it. But a faithful God never runs out. Amen? If I can ever get... See, God will do the same thing with you. He'll take you around the world. Whatever you want to do, He'll take you to the limits you want to go. Right? Most of you will even push you past those limits. All right? But He will take you around the world. Why? Because there's people around the world that need this. They, you just got to get a hold of this message. Right? And this message is the gospel. And that's the good thing I wanted to tell you here. Where are we at time-wise? Oh, you've got to go to lunch here in a minute. I'm going to say something right now and give you something to think about. And if you don't want to come back after lunch, here's your chance to escape. Okay? But what we're going to be talking about these next couple of days, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of camps. There's a lot of groups. There's a lot of churches, denominations, all that kind of stuff. You've got what people call the confession message, you know, positive confession. You've got people call the prosperity message. And, 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 you know, all those things are true, and yet all those things are also taken off into ditches to where you take them to such an extreme that they become error. But you don't throw all of it out just because somebody goes off the deep end, right? You find the truth. But the beauty of this is, okay, look, positive confession, there's truth to that, right? And there's falseness to it. Stick with the truth. But even if you stick with the truth, that's still just a facet of God. You understand? That's just one part. Prosperity. There's truth. There's error. The truth is, God wants you to prosper. Why? So it, it says that it is God who, in Deuteronomy 18, it is God who gives you the, the power to, to get wealth. Not so you can have wealth. The rest of the verse is what counts. So that he may establish his covenant on the earth. See, the focus has to be right. God didn't just want you rich so you'd be rich. He wants you rich, if you want to use those terms, I hate to even use that. But he wants you that way so that you can establish the covenant. So you can plant churches, plant Bible schools, go around the world, minister to people. I got a lady right now up in uh, Oregon. She started out 69 years old, 
and this was about four or five years ago, actually more than that, it was about eight years ago now. Wow, uh, time flies. <laughs> Seems like when you hit 50, time flies faster. I don't know. But <clears throat> when I met her, she was, I didn't even meet her. She was sitting in a meeting, listened to the teaching, totally disagreed with me, was determined to go back to her room that night, proved me totally wrong. She went in, took everything I was saying, went through it, found out it was in the Bible, come back the next day, committed. 69 years old. Since that time, she's been to Thailand five or six times, at least. This woman had never been out of the country, had never been out of Oregon, really. I mean, she'd grown up a couple places, but had never traveled, never been used of God. She sat, heard the message, got a hold of it. Now God has taken her around the world. Now, this, now she's 70, I guess. Wow, 75, 60. I don't want to give, you know, it's not polite, but she's up there. And the amazing thing is, she's teaching pastors. She goes in and has 70, 80, 100 pastors that she teaches this to in, in Thailand, and they're going out and doing it. Oh, and it never, she, she said, it was, I had no clue God was going to use me. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If God will use me, He will use you. Yeah. Believe me, He's more likely to use you than He was me, right? Because I had a lot of things going against me. I tried to make it where He couldn't use me, right? I guarantee you, everybody in this room has probably been a better Christian than I have been even since I gave my life to Christ. Do you understand that? I'm trying to be just totally transparent. There is no reason why God won't use you. The reason He will use you is because He loves them. It's not about you. And He loves, he loves them enough to use even you to help them. Amen? But you have to be willing to step out and believe Him and believe Him. Don't just believe God for little things. Believe Him for big things. Right? Believe him for the dead to be raised. Believe if there's a car wreck and everybody's dead. Believe for all of them to get up. Yes. Right? Don't just settle for one. Believe for the whole thing. Yes. We got to expand. We got to. God is so much bigger than our minds have been. Yes. Amen? Amen. That's where we're headed. And the beauty of this is this enormous, infinite God has agreed to live in us and to walk in us, and talk in us. And he said, now we'll walk in them, and talk in them, and they will be my people, and I'll be their God. That's amazing. I mean, we don't realize, we think, well, have you received the Spirit? Yep, I spoke in tongues. Okay, what's next? Are you kidding? That's what all the old prophets wanted to see. They were waiting for this day when the Spirit of the living God could actually live in men instead of in a temple somewhere. Off over there behind a curtain that nobody could get into except one day a year. Come on. This is what we have. It's not about healing. It's not about prosperity. It's not about deliverance. It's about God living in us, walking in this world. And as we walk past people, them getting healed. As we walk past people, that they reach out and they go, hey, excuse me. Oh, wow. Hey, how'd that happen? Oh, that's, that's, just some, that's just some overflow. That's just some residue, right? Well, I want to be able to do that. No, no, no. There's something much better than that. What's better than being able to do that is having this. Because you can only heal sick people as long as there's sick people around. Well, when you get all the sick people well, if, if your joy is getting the sick people well, when all the sick people are well, your joy is gone. But the fullness of joy in God is having God living in you. That doesn't stop. That's 24-7. That's always good. Even if problems come up, yeah, that's a big problem. What are you going to do about that, God? Because that ain't my problem, right? Hey, I'm your responsibility, right? And he says, well, put your hand on it. It'll disappear. Okay, I'll do that, right? We were in a class in, uh, this one, I'm talking about 97, before I ever really launched out, before I really knew hardly anything, you know, at all. But I'll never forget, we had this, we, were, we had a bookstore, and I was teaching a class on healing. And they were all facing the window, which is not the way you want to set people whenever you're teaching, where they can look out the window and see the cars driving by. And I had my back to it. And... It was real bright because of the windows and the light, and all of a sudden it got real dark, and I noticed it. So I turned to look. There's this huge storm come up. Right then, somebody called us and said, "Oh, there's a tornado over in Gainesville, Texas. It's heading this way. It's coming out." And I said, "Yeah, we just we can see it. It's there. It is. You know, it's right out the window. You know." And I turned around, and you know, people were kind of like, well, "Wow, you know, big glass windows. You know, everybody's like, is there another room we should move to?" And I looked and I said, "Well, looks like we're going to get a chance." To actually practice this. <laughs> so I said, everybody stand up, put your hands out there, and I say this with me. In the name of Jesus, right now, tornado, dissipate. We said, you will dissolve, you will touch nothing in this county. 
You will bypass this county and you will go away in Jesus' name. And, and I had them all standing. They were trying to repeat after me. And they were saying, and you know, half of them were kept repeating, hard to even know what I was saying, but just watching, you know, but saying the words. Don't know how much faith was involved in that part of it. But it was amazing. While they were saying that, they watched this thing go, blue skies. And now, I will say this, that wasn't the end of the lesson. But when we sat back down to go back into the lesson, I had their attention. Right? I mean, they were listening like, wow, this works. I don't understand people that think, well, that's impossible. That's not impossible. Jesus did it. If Jesus did it, we can do it. Because he said, well, not only can we do the things he did, but greater than this. Amen? This is who we are destined to be. What I'm teaching you this week. Now, listen, this is a bold statement, then I'll send you to lunch. I think I've already said that once. But anyway, this, this time I mean it. Okay? There are lots of gospels out there that are not the gospel. There are, there are another gospel. Paul said, if anybody comes preaching another gospel other than one that I've preached to you, let them be accursed. Is that, is that what he said? So there is only one gospel that God counts. Now, I'm telling you, mark my words and listen, because the words I'm going to be saying are going to be straight out of Scripture. You look at your manual, it's Scripture. That's all we're going to look at. We're not talking about theory. We're not talking about commentary. We're not talking about anybody's opinion. I, will, I promise you, I will not give you my opinion while I'm here. I will read Scripture to you and say, it is written, and God means what He said. It means what it said. It means what's written. Right? But I'm here to tell you right now, what I'm teaching you this week, prosperity, a facet of God. Uh, all the 16 names of God, Jehovah Rapha, healing, a facet of God. Not God in His fullness. It's a part of God. Right? Jehovah Shalom, God who is our peace. Not all of God. That's a facet of God. Right? So if we focus on healing, we're only going to see a part of God. If we focus on prosperity, we're only going to see a part of God. If we focus on peace, we're only going to see a part of God. All those things, even the gifts of the Spirit, they're just manifestations of Him. They're not things in themselves. They're just the way He shows Himself. So we shouldn't get hung up on that. We are to, get, we are to see past that and see Him. And once you see Him and then that's who lives in you, then all those things get easy. Why? Because He can manifest Himself any way He wants. And we're with Him. You want to do that? Yeah. Heal the sick? Sure. Gift of healing? There you go. Uh, oh, you need a word of knowledge? Yeah, no problem. He's right there. There you go. That's another facet. Do you see? The fullness of God. Now, what I'm, my statement is this. I, I promise you, check it out, verify it. If you see any variation, you, you know, come tell me right away. Okay? But I'm telling you, what I'm preaching this week, you've heard many messages. You've heard different sermons. This is none of that. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel Paul preached. This is the continuing teaching. This is what Jesus would have taught Christians. He never got a chance to. He only taught Jews, basically. A few Gentiles here and there. This is what Jesus would have taught Christians. If you sat down... Now listen, I'm going to make a... a yeah, I told you, it's a bold statement. If, if you sat down and Jesus walked in that door in the flesh, you know, the robes and the whole bit and the nail scarred and all that stuff and he stood in front of you he's not he would not tell you about gold dust he's not going to tell you about oil you, you know, I'm not putting those things down stuff happens okay but what he would tell you is what I'm teaching you this week do you understand that I know you say well that sounds conceited who do you think you are? no no I'm saying I'm going to step out of the way I'm giving him control I'm going to say only what he said, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit tell you the gospel, of the revelation of Paul. Amen? Not another gospel, not a piece of the gospel, the gospel. When we get into this, by the end of this day, I'm telling you, I get excited this because this is the most exciting thing. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen wheelchairs emptied. What I'm teaching here. If I wasn't teaching it, I'd be in my motel room reading it. It is more exciting than anything I've ever seen. Any, any event, any dead raising, any wheelchair empty, any of that, this is more exciting because it has so much further ramification and it shows God and his goodness to us. Amen? This is that gospel. It's amazing. And what, what amazes me the most is how have we not seen it? How have we missed it? to a large degree. There's been bits and pieces. 
And the funny thing is, all the people you like, Wigglesworth, Lake, Amy Simple, McPherson, all those people, every one of them had a portion of this. They saw it and they knew how to walk in that portion, but none of them, from what I can tell, ever preached the fullness of it in its entirety the way we're going to do it this week. And I, I'm really happy because this is the first time I'm getting to teach it like this. So I'm excited about this. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's go to lunch. We will see you at 2 o'clock, and we will kick this thing back off because I want to get into this. Amen?